1070U, Psychological Foundations and Digital Technologies, Module 10, Video 10.1, Mastery and Expertise. Here are the guiding questions for this video. How do you define expertise? And what are the characteristics of an expert? What is considered mastery in your professional world? And how do you measure expertise and mastery? What psychological strategies does Terry Orlick refer to as necessary to achieve excellence? Let's brainstorm. If I entered a room full of masters and experts, what might I see? What would it look like? What would it sound like? Brainstorm what expertise actually is. Make a list of the things you would expect to see or hear in a room full of experts in your field. Here's something to reflect on, what the experts usually say. Listen to us, we're the experts. With their degrees and their expertise, they often make you feel like your role in any discussion is merely to nod your head and sign off on their suggestions. But you're an expert too. Finish reading this quotation and reflect on what it means for you and some areas of your own life. Terry Orlick is a sports psychologist from the University of Ottawa and he studied high performers across numerous domains including athletics but also medicine, law, business, the arts, and aerospace. He's created a model that identifies common mental attributes that occur in these performers and from his classic book In Pursuit of Excellence he says there are seven critical components of personal excellence that have continued to surface as the essence of excellence. The presence of these basic elements allows individuals to become the best they can possibly be in their chosen pursuit. Orlick's seven elements of excellence are as follows. Commitment, belief in yourself, an ability to fully focus, and also to have good distraction control. The ability to use constructive evaluation to maintain positive images and focus in your mind, and a mental readiness. Well. How did your brainstorm definition from slide one compare to Orlick's list of skills? Here are thoughts from a few others on excellence. What are the applications in the professional world, and how can this be applied to both education and other professions? Joyce and Schauer state this, Athletes do not believe mastery will be achieved quickly or easily. They understand that enormous effort results in small increments of change. We, on the other hand, have often behaved as though teaching skills were so easily acquired that a simple presentation, one-day workshop, or demonstration were sufficient to ensure a successful classroom performance. Perhaps you could think of an example from your professional life where the drop-in workshop was expected to help you become excellent at a specific skill. So where in here is the rule for mistakes in your educational system? Do you think professionals are allowed to or are encouraged to make mistakes? I'm not sure I'd want my brain surgeon making a mistake. What about teachers? Are they allowed to make mistakes? What are the implications of this? As compared to training for law, medicine, Olympic athletes, and other professionals, 10 years is pretty much consistently decided to be the minimum to be considered approaching mastery in any event. So in discussion forum this week, what are your views on this? Should we extend professional training to promote mastery? Should we change professional training to promote mastery, and how would you change it? Should we be identifying master performers in the field that you work in as mentors? And should we reward that mastery with a financial or a, some other kind of gain? Should mastery itself be rewarded, or is it its own reward? Moving on to the concept of expertise, we're going to look at the work of Berta and Scardamalia, who wrote the book Surpassing Ourselves. And they said that expertise defies precise definition, and to impose a definition on it on the outset would be a sophomoric exercise almost guaranteed to stifle productive thought. Peters and Waterman studied excellence in companies and in the business world and wrote the book In Search of Excellence, and they say that they tried not to be too precise at the beginning about what they meant by excellence or innovation. 
We were afraid at that point that had we tried to be too precise, we would lose the essence of what we thought we were actually after. According to Berder and Scardamalia, the capacity to acquire expertise is, they argue, one of the great and peculiar strengths of the human species. We need to understand better what it means to acquire expertise, what fosters and what stunts its development, and how it functions in people's lives and work. They talk about the difference between experts and novices, that the difference between experts and non-experts is not that one does things well and the other does things badly. Rather, the expert addresses problems, whereas the experienced non-expert carries out practiced routines. You might think of this in people you've worked with who say, we've just always done it this way. It's only when the routines fail that the difference between experts and non-experts becomes manifest. This is when we need creativity, if you think back to our work on intelligence and how we're able to work in different ways and find novel solutions. How do we address adult education models and professional development in other fields to make that learning meaningful, transferable, and really useful for real-world situations? Here's a few more thoughts on expertise and intuition. There's a really interesting book called The Intuitive Practitioner on the Value of Not Always Knowing What One Is Doing by Atkinson and Claxton. And they say that experience, per se, is not the sole determinant of expertise. So you could have been doing the same job for 30 years, but that doesn't make you an expert. Intuitive processing of information is often posited as another hallmark characteristic of expert practitioners. Wow, so a little bit later in this next module, we're going to be talking about spirituality and technology. So that's where we start touching on intuition processing of information. They also say that we can indeed learn to improve the frequency, reliability, and quality of our intuitions. And learning to be intuitive means learning what those conditions are for yourself. Though stillness and solitariness are often quoted, these conditions are personal and idiosyncratic. In other words, you have to find out what works for you. Intuition refers to a loose-knit family of ways of knowing, which are less articulate and explicit than normal reasoning. This family has tended to be ignored, marginalized, romanticized, or denigrated in mainstream educational cultures. Remember, we tend to be left-brain culture that is logical and rational. Because its historical association and for validity seems grandiose or mystical, or we don't really understand it. But, remember Berater and Scardamalia? They said that expertise means working in new and changing situations. So, it's pretty important to go beyond what you actually already know to something you don't know. Intuition lets us function fluently and flexibly in complex domains without being able to describe or rationally theorize why you're an expert. Another way to think of this is the concept of flow that Mikhail Chichin Mahali refers to Flow is a state of immersed concentration where it's centered, distractions are minimized, and the person attains an enjoyable give and take with the activity. This fluid intelligence is demonstrated in expert performances in many professions, and is often the feeling that Olympic gold medalists will say they had during their best performances ever. Can you describe a time when you had a flow experience in your life or work? What conditions were present? Did you feel at one with the universe? connected, that things were flowing in your way. Think about that and bring that to tutorial. Should your teachers be experts? Berater and Scardamalia argue that teaching is not the sort of occupation in which you want people to be experts. Teachers should be caring, sensitive people, and teaching is a complex human enterprise that can't be reduced to technique. So teachers ought not to seal themselves off as a community of experts, but ought to be involved with and responsive to the communities in which they serve. Think about the technological implications of this, and I can tell you that one of the examples I want to give you is that in order to create this course, I was not the expert in creating videos. So I would not put myself in a technological expertise framework. But I know how to create the community, and I was able to access people in my community to help me learn. Excellent teachers are not necessarily experts. They are active, striving people. They work long hours, usually at something they consider to be quite difficult, and they tend to set standards for themselves that are always slightly beyond their reach. The same could probably be said of many other professions. Think of what you define as an excellent professional in your area of life work. Professionals and teachers 
when they are excellent, share many characteristics. They like to laugh and have fun. They're ravenous learners. Their minds are seldom idle. They're determined, courageous, and resilient. Think of some of the physicians maybe you know. And they care so deeply about their work that they swing from exhilaration to despair, depending on the success of their efforts. Does this describe the best expert or master professionals that you know? Why or why not? What would Donald Schoen say about this? We talked about him and his ideas of reflection in action and reflection on action. He said that if you're going to be excellent, you need to go beyond technical competence to a level of human interaction that involves an intuitive, artistic component. From his book, the Educating the Reflective Practitioner, is this quote, Inherent in the practice of professionals as we recognize as unusually competent is a core of artistry. The artistry of painters, sculptors, musicians, dancers, and designers bears a strong family resemblance to the artistry of extraordinary lawyers, physicians, managers, or teachers. It is no accident that professionals often refer to an art of teaching or management and use the term artist to refer to practitioners who are unusually adept at handling situations of uncertainty, uniqueness, or conflict. Here are the synthesis questions for today. What are the factors in your organization or school or work environment that promote expertise? What are the factors that are barriers to the development of expertise? Is there a reward for mastery or expertise in your profession, either a monetary or other promotional award? And how are you personally encouraged to develop expertise? How can you create those conditions for yourself where mastery of your profession will occur? I look forward to chatting with you in tutorial.